It took the sound and fury of the strangest war in the history of the world to acquaint many English-speaking Christians with the existence of Korea. Terrain, climate, the people and their way of life were unknown. And even now, many identify the land only in terms of casualty lists, political arguments, and such contemporary bywords as Heartbreak Ridge, the 38th Parallel, and Panmunjom. In reality, however, Korea is one of the most fascinating countries of the Orient. A land where the new world constantly rubs elbows with the old, but where the old remains always the same. The country, thrust down as a peninsula from Manchuria between China and Japan, is 600 miles long, 135 miles wide. Within this area of only 86,000 square miles, about half the size of California, live 25 million people. The heaviest population is, of course, in the south, where large masses of refugees fled during the war years. Nationalism thrives in Korea. Because of its strategic location, the country has been for many generations the battleground for Asiatic supremacy. And yet, the people have never lost hope in their ultimate and complete emancipation. Not even during the many dismal years when they have worn the chafing yoke of foreign imperialism. Following the close of World War II, leadership fell onto the shoulders of Syngman Rhee, shown here at inaugural ceremonies. Clashing world ideologies divided his country north and south, yet he stood firm and unafraid, a great symbol of his people's strength and spirits. The roots of Korea's past grew deep in the soil of paganism. And while today the country is no longer listed as Buddhist, temples and shrines are found everywhere. Long ago, missionary leaders discovered that wherever one hears the pagan call of temple gongs, he finds people to whom life brings many burdens. Korea is no different. Except for the privileged few, everyone spends long hours each day in hard physical labor. These physical burdens illustrate the greater spiritual burdens cast upon those who have not heard the voice of Jesus calling, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lady, the next time you complain about doing the family wash in your modern home laundry, think about these women in Korea. life much easier for the men. They go about their work in much the same fashion as did their ancestors generations ago. The hardest lot of all falls upon the almost omnipresent leper. Welfare agencies try to ease his misery, but only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring meaning to his pitiful existence. The marketplace provides much of the social life for the common man in Korea. Here he learns what goes on in the community and has an opportunity to discuss topics of the day. In spite of numerous mountain ranges, much of the land produces edible crops and in normal times provides enough food for everyone. Korean history and folklore show no trace of a nomadic ancestry. Through the centuries, these people have been farmers. The food, typically oriental, is highly spiced. The best known dish, kimchi, has a cabbage base peppered with herbs and garlic. It has an odor distinctly its own. Because night soil serves as fertilizer, the wholesomeness of fresh food often serves as a guise for hazardous microbes. By tradition, 
Korean men wear white clothes, the color of mourning. For since the death of a monarch might be mourned as long as 30 years, the men found it expedient to wear white all the time. During their long occupation of Korea, the Japanese tried to discourage the custom and even went so far as to throw buckets of paint on passers-by. But the Koreans stuck to their tradition. Regardless of the garb he wears, the Korean is every inch a man and knows how to drive a hard bargain. Here are Korea's choices, sight, the children. In spite of poverty and hardship, they never seem to lose their winsome charm. This lad proudly wears his schoolboy uniform. The kindergarten model comes in a smaller size. Yes, there's a recipe for mud pies in Korea, too. And the little shavers get their hands just as dirty. As the 20th century reached its halfway mark, death struck across Korea with devastating fury. Although labeled a police action when United Nations troops intervened, casualty lists soon took on the proportions of total war. These exclusive scenes, taken at the front by Fred Jarvis, show the grim reality of the enigma thrown across the plans of peace-seeking nations across the world. When the skirmish is over, weary survivors climb aboard tanks and journey back to the comparative safety of a bivouac behind the lines.
To catch the pulse beat of what was happening, Fred Jarvis spent considerable time with UN troops. As an Evangelical Alliance missionary, Youth for Christ evangelist, and Christian Life magazine foreign correspondent, he wanted inside information on the morale and spiritual welfare of men in uniform. Here in the late afternoon, far from home and loved ones, a group of GIs gather for worship. Many had to come all the way to Korea before they learned what it means to place one's faith in God through his son, Jesus Christ. War holds no glory for these men. Yet God makes the wrath of men praise him, and the Korean War is no exception. Not only have many found Christ as Savior, but others, realizing that the world's only hope rests in the propagation of the gospel, plan someday to return as missionaries. One of the byproducts of the Korean conflict has been the extended development of helicopters as implements of mercy to those in distress. The odd-looking crafts, maneuverable as hummingbirds, can land anywhere from the top of a mountain to the bottom of a canyon. Fred Jarvis tries a strongman act as the copter hovers between sky and earth. Here, in a more serious role, a helicopter returns from the front with empty blood plasma cartons. Some American boy lives today because this mercy flight brought the blood you gave before it was too late. A second craft returns from its mission of mercy, and another life is spared. Statistics show that of every 1,000 casualties in Korea, all but 22 survived. And the average time for a wounded soldier to reach a hospital was 30 minutes. In modern war, civilians, the women and children, the old and infirm, often suffer more than those who shoulder the guns. In Korea, earth-scorching land action has been fought from Pusan to the Yalu. Artillery and mortar fire left entire cities in almost complete ruin. One can only estimate the ghastly toll of those who perished. Yet the spirit of these people has never faltered. They could be beaten, but they could not be conquered.
Driven from their homes, hundreds of destitute families congregated in the streets, easy prey to exposure and disease. Others scraped together a few coins or sold some of their meager possessions and purchased grass mats with which to construct some kind of shelter. As many as 10 people live in one of these tiny hovels, and while they fare better than those with nothing over their heads, the death rate among even these runs extremely high. Missionary leaders and heads of service organizations believe that no war of the past ever inflicted so much suffering upon so high a percentage of a nation's populace. Most heartrending of all are the orphans, innocent children who have lost both father and mother and have no one to love them, no one to care for them. War always brings shortages of food, and hunger can be one of the greatest torments a man ever experiences. As the stalemate dragged on in Korea, only a comparative few had enough food. These people, utterly destitute, foraged through a garbage dump, trying to find something to eat. Missionary societies and well. Many United Nations soldiers adopted war orphans as mascots. Shine, Mystic. The heart of a soldier can be very soft. And so the price on shines is reasonable because the tips are always generous. Pan Mun Jong. As long as the world lasts, that word will be used whenever men speak of international frustration, double talk, and the merchandising of men's souls. The North Korean delegation led by Nam Il is the first to put in an appearance. UN spokesmen arrive by helicopter. The UN leader, Major General William K. Harrison, is known by Christians around the world as a devout believer. Day after day, it was the same. The two factions met for a few moments. Neither had anything new to report except perhaps to unleash a few tirades. Here, Major General Harrison tells reporters that there are no new developments. He and his men will return another day. It was a clever trap, Han Mun Jan spawned in the minds of men whose goal is to rule the world. And men everywhere, tired of war and tension, watch and wait and wonder. Yet in spite of the stalemate at Panmunjom and on the battlefront, the Korean people kept their courage, confident that the United Nations would find a way to bring them freedom. President Dwight Eisenhower's post-election visit did much to heighten morale among the South Koreans. Although Ike, because of security precautions, made practically no public appearances, wherever he looked, he found evidence of this people's unwavering faith in his ability to help them. The Republic of Korea government faced the constant threat of enemy infiltration. As the war lingered on, Every possible precaution was taken against fifth column action from the north. The arm of judgment fell hard upon anyone convicted as a spy. Rising casualty lists added to the nation's mounting problems as the determined rock soldier took an increasingly prominent role in the conflict. But Korea's most significant story seldom made the pages of our newspapers. That story is of the Christian church which stood unmoved against the fires of testing. Many church buildings were destroyed, yet the real church 
the men and women who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, lived on. Missionaries found open doors everywhere for evangelism. The church had laid a good foundation. Few Christians realized the strength of the church in Korea, an organism with apostolic fervency. Capacity crowds attend church on Sunday. And in many cases, a new convert cannot take church membership until he has first won someone else. Among the unchurched, native coal porters have found a ready market for the sale of scripture portions. Here is real spiritual hunger, a field white unto harvest. Missionaries report that Korean Christians seldom ask God to bring peace to their land. They ask him to bring spiritual awakening, no matter what the price may be. And the price for many has been very great. In one city, North Korean troops searched every home and killed entire families if a Bible or hymn book was found. Yet in this time of greatest persecution, the Korean church has moved steadily forward. Fred Jarvis, in his work as a United Nations correspondent, spent considerable time in personal interviews with President Syngman Rhee. Rhee, vitally interested in the activity of missionaries and the local church, has pledged his full cooperation in reaching his people with the gospel. Rhee believes that the reason North Korea made its sneak attack below the 38th parallel was because the impact of Christianity upon South Korean students made infiltration into schools impossible. Here, during one of the interviews, President Rhee discusses with Jarvis and Tom Watson, another Evangelical Alliance missionary, plans for a radio station in Busan, which would beam the message of salvation across Korea and on into China. The spiritual solution these leaders believe is the answer to Korea's problem. And so there you have it, the Korea story. What about the future? A great deal of that depends on you. These people need your help, your prayers. Some of them may never hear the good news of the gospel unless you go and tell them, or unless you send someone. Korea is a great imperative, for what happens there may decide the fate of the entire world.